Hello, all you wonderful people out there in the dark. Thank you again for checking in. So corn cobs and flak jackets. I'm glad you're, glad you're here. Stick with me. I think you'll find this interesting. So 1821. 1821, a German guy named Wolfgang Delbriner. Now this cat, he discovers a chemical he calls furfural. Now it's a byproduct of some experiment that he does that quite frankly, I don't understand. It doesn't really matter. He does what all scientists do. Um, he writes a very long paper about his discovery for for all. And no one really pays any attention, quite frankly, for, for damn near 100 years. But um, in about 1840, a Scottish chemist named uh, John Stenhouse, uh, he sort of discovers that fur for all actually can be found um, in, in corn, corn cobs, oats, bran, even sawdust, um, that it sort of exists. No one really thinks a whole lot about it uh, because in just a few short years, in 1845, there's a terrible potato famine in Ireland. Now this potato famine, uh, excuse me, potato famine, it literally, over a million people starved to death. A million people starved to death. And in 1845, this island is still under British rule. I think it's Westminster. Um, I don't think Ireland was, was free until like 1922. So the, the British let a million people starve to death. Now one effect of this famine, besides a great migration of the Irish to America, is uh, the Brits, uh, they loosen up their, their import rules, which allow us to bring corn and uh, actually tea from China uh, to England. And, and we do it the most effectively because at that time, our ships known as clippers, well, we have the fastest ships on the ocean, kind of like the fastest hunks of junk in the galaxy. I, I, I'm gonna say from the late 1850s on, uh, the United States basically, we, we rule the oceans. Um, but again, in the mid to late 1850s, we're growing food at an incredible rate, which we'll get to, which we talked about in a previous video, but we'll talk about it in that in a minute. Um, but a million people, they, they starved to death. In 1866, in the state of Michigan, uh, there's a health spa known as the Battle Creek Sanatorium, and it's run by this cat named Dr. John Kellogg, and his kid brother, William Kellogg, is the bookkeeper. Now, the, the, a couple things come out of the sanatorium. Um, and for the record, sanatorium or sanitarium, which is what they changed the name to. They kind of coined the phrase. I think they thought it sounded better. Um, what a sanitarium is, is, is essentially a place for, the, for people with chronic illness, whether that be mental, physical, um, I don't know, whatever. But pe people would go there who were exhausted and Dr. Kellogg would try to teach them how to eat healthy, live healthy, think healthy, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Um, one of the things that the sanitarium actually did was prepare food. And uh, they were working on um, some sort of breakfast uh, product. And I'm not sure exactly what happened, but essentially they ran some wheat through a press and they created wheat flakes rather accidentally. Well, they served it and it went over fairly well. And uh, uh, William Kellogg wanted to do the same with corn because it was sweeter and had sugar because he saw an opportunity, quite frankly, I think, to sell a, a, a ton of this stuff. Well, Dr. John Kellogg balked at that idea and wanted to stick with wheat. Well, his brother, uh, Will, wasn't having that. So he basically, in 1906, uh, created a company called the Battle Creek uh, uh, Toasted Corn Flake Corporation. It changed names a couple of times, but by 1922, the company was simply called Kellogg. We all know who Kellogg is. And cornflakes still exist today. Now, some famous people actually stayed at the sanitarium. Henry Ford, Amelia Earhart, Mary Todd Lincoln. Yes, that Mary Todd Lincoln. A cat named James Cash Penny. Horrible name, but we know him best as J.C. Penny. And another guy named Charles William Post. Yes, C.W. Post, the other serial magnet. He stayed at the sanitarium that created cornflakes. 
And when he gets out of the sanitarium, he starts his company and he doesn't make cornflakes, he makes corn toasties. He doesn't make malted nuts, he makes grape nuts. I can only imagine the lawsuits that ensued. But they start growing corn like mad or buying corn like mad. And you know, there's corn cobs aplenty and they're using it for chicken feed and cow feed. And I'm sure they're throwing it in swampy areas to try to dry up land and whatnot. And I don't know how many pipes you can make from corn cobs, but I'm sure they made a boatload of them. Now, a little bit sooner, you'll recall uh, in our last video in 1851, this guy named Edward Atchison, do you remember him? He took carbon black, he superheated it in these electric ovens, and he basically invented a carborundum. And what carborundum, in its chemical name, which is easier for me to say, is silicon carbide. Now, silicon carbide, we discover, is sharper, it's basically, it'll cut a diamond. It's the second strongest uh, 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 basically thing on the planet at that time. And it's used everywhere. Now, in 1893, Atchison is actually working for a cat named George Westinghouse. And what Georgie is working on is a workaround for Edison's patent for the light bulb. And what he's trying to do is instead of uh, is create a, a two-part light bulb where you've got the bulb and the element's gonna thread into the bulb. And the reason that works is because of Atchison's discovery of silicone carbide, because they're able to get a cutter to make the threads uh, exacting enough to when they, th they thread the element up into the bulb, it creates a seal and the light bulb works. Changes everything. Um, about that same time, um, 1893 or so, there's a guy on the other coast out here in California in the San Joaquin Valley. His name is Benjamin Holt. Now, now Ben is having the same success with uh, um, farming. His crop yields are growing exponentially and he's trying to figure out a better way than just using the old horse and plow trying to get stuff done more efficiently. And he's working on a thing called a traction engine. Well, in 1903, his first success happens. Take a look. So that's essentially the first tractor. Now, some of his friends uh, comment that when it's running, it resembles a caterpillar, because it kind of lurches along like that, like a caterpillar does. So what does Ben do? Well, Mr. Holt, he names his company Caterpillar. Now what's amazing about this tractor is those tracks in the San Joaquin Valley, soil is very, very soft. And then those long tracks distribute the weight of that tractor evenly across uh, the ground so it doesn't sink in. And that third wheel allows it to go up and down in ditches without, without getting stuck. Huge success changes farming as we know it. Now, of course, it ends up going over to Europe. Also a huge, huge success. But now we're itching closer to the Great War. Um, in 1914, uh, uh, the assassination of, Arch, uh, of Archduke Ferdinand happens. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Princip, the Serbian... Uh, shoots him and, and World War I essentially kicks off. So a couple things happen. First, uh, the, uh, the folks in Britain recognize that tractor and those tracks and they invent a tank. And it's called a tank because it resembles uh, water tanks in the time period, but it's a, it's a tank like we know it today. Take a look. Now that changes the, the scope of the war because the Germans have spread out all of this barbed wire all over the place. It's a trench war, right? And the soldiers are getting hung up literally in this barbed wire and it's very hard to move once you're caught up in barbed wire. And if you're not moving, you're an easy target. So these tanks are able just to barrel along and knock down the barbed wire and allow soldiers just to, to, to press on and press forward. It's really the reason we won the war. Now, during that time, a couple other things are, are come along during World War One: Mustard gas, flash grenades, and smoke bombs. Now, flash grenades and smoke bombs, you already know what those are. That's the devil's element. That's phosphorus. 
the bright flash and then the, the smoke that, that follows makes it very easy for Germans to pick people off. Mustard gas, uh, that, that comes to being uh, by a cat named uh, Fritz uh, Haber. Now Haber, he's the Haber in the Haber uh, Bosch process. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's the process that these two cats figured out how to basically mass produce uh, ammonia. And ammonia is used in two things, bombs and fertilizer. You remember back in the previous video, uh, Justice von Liebig, he was working in the late 1850s on uh, figuring out what plants took from the soil. He burned them and he discovered it was phosphorus and he created phosphorus fertilizer. Well, about the same time, um, uh, Haber and, and Bosch are, are doing the same thing and they're creating fertilizer using ammonia. But Fritz takes ammonia and starts making mustard gas, which is basically something I, I the short answer, I think it basically boils your lungs. It sounds really painful. And yes, if the name Carl Bosch sounds familiar, his uncle, is uh, Robert Bosch, the guy who invented the spark plug. So, anyway, World War One. Um, uh, one of the things that that come out of uh, those tanks is the Germans start pushing forward for for some, the only way you can stop them is to get an armor-piercing ammo or load. So they, they start working on on that stuff heavily. And if we fast forward just momentarily to the mid to late 60s, America is embroiled in another conflict called Vietnam. Well, Vietnam is a different sort of conflict for us because it's jungle training, and we're using helicopters to bring wounded out and put soldiers in. And the brilliance of a helicopter is it can hover in one spot. But what's the problem when you sit in one spot? You're a sitting duck for people shooting at you, which... They sort of solved this problem by taking Furfural. Remember Furfural, that adhesive that they were putting on grinding wheels that Westinghouse used to make his, his two-part light bulb? Well, they used that adhesive and silicone carbine and they lined the inside of the helicopters to try to make the bullets bounce off so they, they stopped killing guys inside the helicopter, which leads to flak jackets. By wearing a flak jacket with silicone carbine, half the wounds end up not being fatal when guys get shot. Uh, which is which, which is absolutely absolutely huge. Now, let's kind of jump way back um, to the 1860s, uh, right around the Civil War. Uh, there's this there's this guy named uh, Adolphus Bush, and well, he marries this gal named Lily Anheuser, Anheuser Bush. Now, in 1897, uh, one of his technical directors convinces him to buy the rights to uh, the diesel engine in America because he remembers or worked with this guy named Rudolf Diesel who way back in um, uh, 1892 is working with this German named Carl von Lindy who's trying, who's using ammonia. You remember ammonia that was invented by uh, Fritz Haber or at least mass produced by Fritz Haber. So von Lindy is trying to take ammonia and, and make refrigerant units to keep beer cold. And Rudolf Diesel was one of his protégés working him, with him on those projects in the late 1890s. Well, in 1897, at some point, Diesel left von Lindy and his refrigerators and he goes on to create uh, the diesel engine and, and his first real success with that was in 1897. And again, Anheuser-Busch, uh, or Adolphus Bush, was smart enough and listened to his technical director and bought the rights to diesel in America. And in 1898, the first diesel engines start running an Anheuser-Busch plant uh, burning uh, crude oil, which is important because at that time period, refining oil into gas is very expensive and very, very limited. And remember, a gas engine, how does it work? There's a cylinder and there's a piston and the exact amount of air and fuel go into that go into that cylinder and at the exact right time a spark plug remember the spark plug Robert uh, Bosch uh, sparks exploding the fuel forcing the, the, the piston down and an engine 
Well, what diesel does is instead of uh, the spark, he compresses the air um, to the point, I think it's like 14,500 degrees or 15,000 degrees. And when a little bit of fuel is shot in, just the heat and pressure of the air causes that fuel to ignite, forcing the piston down. And what's brilliant about it is uh, fuel is very, very expensive and, and hard to get, quite frankly. And a diesel engine, hell, it'll burn, it'll burn on crude oil, peanut oil, almost, almost anything that'll catch fire. And it doesn't take long for Europe to put it in tractors. Remember Mr. Holt? His steam engine tractors become diesel tractors. And the Europeans put them in tanks, battleships, even in their luxury cars in, in the 30s, Mercedes-Benz. Um, they basically end up in everything in Europe. And be, because of uh, Adolphus Bush, diesels, he, he has the rights to them here and it makes him probably more money than he ever could have imagined. So let's bring it kind of back all the way to Del Briner uh, discovers Fur For All. Not a whole lot happens with Fur For All, but uh, it's a byproduct of food that's able to be grown in mass quantities because of the work of Fritz Haber and Lee Brig uh, with fertilizer and guys like Holt who invent tractors to be able to make get the food from the ground to the store more quickly, which quite frankly lends everybody to more leisure time, which allows people to travel more. And 70 years ago, when people used to travel, you've heard the phrase, when in Rome, you'd go someplace to Greece or, or England, or wherever you went. And, and you, you basically enjoyed the exotic nature of wherever you were. Um, you, you went in Rome, you ate what they ate, you did what they did to experience that. Well, today, the world is so global and so international, when people travel, no one's really interested in eating, I don't know, fried ants, tripe, cheese and olives, whatever odd thing that, that that culture may eat, we have a more international fare. And what's the number one item sold in hotels around the world, breakfast food? Cornflakes. Oh, uh, cornflakes. So, fur for all, silicone carbide, still used today. Oh, by the way, Quaker Oats in 1940, They've, they're, they're, they've got so much oak, so much corn cob, that they actually start factories that produce fur for all on a full-time basis because, again, it's used as an adhesive, uh, 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 synthetic rubber, solvents, um, uh, just a myriad of things. It, it's, it, it is in everything. And because it is a uh, product that's made from basically vegetables, it's completely renewable. Um, and it, today, especially, it's going to be used more and more and more as we get off of oil and its byproducts. I don't know. Hopefully you enjoyed this. This kind of stuff absolutely fascinates me. Um, uh, please, please dig around. Uh, there, there's so much stuff in history that's interesting. Uh, look some of this stuff up. Do your own investigations. Crack a book. Google. Uh, please comment. Um, I'll continue to dig. Hopefully you enjoy these. I enjoy sharing these with you. Uh, but anyway, um, in this world, when you can be anything in the world you want, please be kind, please be humble, be forgiving, and be melting snow. Bye-bye.